Okay, all good with the QR code. Okay, now then let's look at the three statements together. Okay, so basically these are all related to what we discussed on Monday about forecasting. So the first one is the best long run forecast of a mean reverting series is its mean. So is this correct or is it wrong? Okay, this is a correct statement. Remember, a mean reverting series, basically absence of shocks, it will just tends to revert to its long run mean following one deviation, say, at the starting value, and then it will just stay there forever. So obviously the best long run forecast of a mean reverting series will be its mean, the long run mean, okay? And that's why it makes forecasting with stationary time series that popular. Because with stationary time series, we know that it's mean reverting. So the long run optimal forecast for a stationary time series is always its long run mean. And that's very useful for designing policies and kind of want to gauge what the implication of the policy will be like in the long run, okay? So this is the first one. And the next statement, which is that forecasts are based on assumptions about current and historical data, trends, and patterns. Is this correct or is it wrong? So for those who just joined, I'll give you five more seconds to scan this QR code. Five, four, three, two, one. Okay, time's up. So this is, again, a correct statement. Remember, on Monday, we talk about forecasting on the A with an AR1 model. And it was last Friday, we essentially established the fact that the AR1 model is essentially a descriptive model that kind of like the causal model where it comes with assumptions, okay? While being descriptive, we assume that the error terms are ID white noise, and we assume that these error terms are independent of all past information of Y. So essentially, we make the assumption that these error terms are shocks, okay? Then, essentially, any descriptive model we attempt to use to describe the pattern of the underlying data comes with assumptions. Okay, it's just that certain assumptions make these descriptive model to coincide mathematically as the regression model. Okay, so essentially forecasts are based on assumptions and indeed forecasts are based on the underlying data, the trends, the patterns that we observe. And we assume implicitly that these patterns we observe in the historical data will carry over into the future and that's what make our forecasting reliable. If we don't make such assumptions, why would we believe that tomorrow our series will continue the AR1 model, or why tomorrow our series, let's say, it might follow an AR2, it might follow an, a random walk, okay? So when we, make uh, when we make forecasting, we're essentially assuming that the pattern we observe in the past will continue in the future. <coughs> the relationship between let's say why, and in, in its immediate past will carry over and continue into the future that we expect to forecast. And because of this, the longer the forecasting horizon, the more uncertainty there are, because the further away you're forecasting into the future, the less likely these assumptions that you made based on the historical data will continue to be valid for the future observations, okay? So the uncertainty that underlies the forecasting comes from the assumptions that we made about the historical data and that we assume that these assumptions remain valid, which might not likely be the case because there might be a sudden change in the policy that makes your series 
let's say from stationary to a non-stationary one, or it could be that another policy come in that suddenly just change your mean value that it no longer be the same one as previously the um, policy was implemented, okay? So forecasts are based on assumptions and that the forecast will become less and less accurate as we forecast into the further future, okay? Because there's increasing uncertainty coming in. So this is the second statement. Now, the last one, sort of related to what we've discussed in the past couple of weeks, and in a sense related to quiz one that we've done. So what it says here is that strong persistence in a time series implies non-stationarity, and therefore a persistent time series cannot be stationary and should not be used for forecasting. So is this a correct statement or is this false? So basically, it's making two sort of claims. One is that a persistent time series cannot be stationary, and the other one is that a persistent time series should not be used for forecasting, okay? So can this be correct? So again, the majority wins. This is a false statement. First of all, persistence or strong persistence is not the same as non-stationarity. And similarly, weak persistence is not the same as stationarity. We'll come back to this um, later today. At the end of the lecture, we'll do a recap on persistence and stationarity. Essentially, they describe different aspects of the underlying time series and they do not directly imply each other. And we call from the AI1 model, okay, remember there was some plots about the ACFs where we essentially have one corresponding to an AI1 with an other one that is 0.95. Technically, an AI1 model with an autoregressive coefficient that is equal to 0.95 is still stationary because it has constant mean, constant variance, and constant autocorrelation structure but it has a very strong persistence because the speed of the time series reverting back to the mean is very slow and that's also very obvious from the ACF plot. So a strong, a time series, uh, sorry, a time series that exhibits strong persistence can still be stationary as long as it satisfies the defining condition for stationarity. And think a bit more about this. If we want to link strong persistence with non-stationarity, then how do we really quantify strong persistence? What does it mean by strong persistence, okay? If strong persistence has to be the same as non-stationarity, what is the cutoff value for something that is really strong so that it becomes non-stationary? It doesn't make sense. There's no such way to quantify it. Okay, so strong persistence is not the same as non-stationarity, and similarly, weak persistence is not the same as stationarity, okay? Therefore, the first claim it aims to make that a persistence time series cannot be stationary is wrong. A stationary time series can be persistent, it can have some sort of strong persistence as long as its statistical properties remain constant over time, okay? And next, a, a persistent time series should not be used for forecasting. Again, this is wrong. So first of all, a persistent time series, let's say a strong one, that basically implies the past has a prolonged effect on the future. And to a sense, a persistent time series is actually very good for short-term forecasting because the best guess of the next period is what happens today, given that they're highly correlated, okay? So effectively, a persistent time series will give us a very good long, uh, sorry, short-term forecasting. Now, whether it's good for long-term forecasting, that then depends on whether this highly persistent time series is stationary or not, okay? 
If it's stationary, then yes, it will be good for long-term forecasting, but if this highly persistent time series is also non-stationary, then that will imply the forecasting error will grow unboundedly as the forecasting horizon increases, as we've seen on Monday from the graph, okay? When we attempt to forecast using the GDP data, which is non-stationary, we can see that as the forecasting horizon increases, okay, the red line, which is the actual times uh, GDP for the period that we are forecasting, becomes further and further away from the forecasted value, which is given by the dark line here within the shaded area, okay? So any attempt to use non-stationary time series to make long-run forecasting will just make your um, forecasted value more and more or increasingly unreliable as H increases. Whereas if we use the growth data, okay, and again, where the red, um, the red line follow, uh, sorry, plots the actual times, uh, the actual time series for the forecasted horizon, and we can see that while the dark line sort of stays at the long run mean value, follows the initial return to the mean the red line sort of falls mainly within the shaded area, which tells us that our long run forecast, while the exact point forecast differs from the actual time series, the forecasted value kind of give us a reliable guess of what the future values would be within some level of uncertainty, given by the fact that the red line falls majority in the shaded area, except for the 2008, the financial crisis, where there's a very substantial shock that sort of drives the actual growth away from the shaded area, okay? But there's nothing wrong with our model. It's just that the fact that the shock is so large that it makes it to be highly deviated from what we forecasted. So this is a false statement. A persistent time series can be stationary, can be non-stationary, depending on whether the time series itself satisfies the three defining conditions of stationarity. And again, persistent time series will be very useful for short-term forecasting, but whether it's useful for long-term <laughs> forecasting depends on whether it's stationary or not. So these are the three quick, quick questions before we look at forecasting evaluation today. So just a roadmap of what's leading up. So whenever one attempts to do forecasting, the first step is really to check whether the underlying data or the time series is stationary and prepare your data for forecasting. If the time series is not stationary, then we need to sort of stabilize it, transform it, or just take a subsample where it appears stationary to do forecasting. And we'll talk about formal detection of non-stationarity next week and also the week afterwards. That's coming up in chapters 12 and 13. Right now, we're in chapter 11, forecasting, okay? And by the way, the lecture notes have now included chapter 11. So anything between chapter nine and 11 is examinable for quiz two plus hypothesis testing question. I'm gonna continue asking hypothesis testing question until the successful rate pass 80%, okay? So once we prepare the data for forecasting, now the next step is to estimate the model and generate your forecast. And we sort of talk about the model selection, picking the appropriate model for forecasting when we talk about higher order AI model, determining the optimal length, that could be stepwise testing down procedure or it could be using BIC or AIC. So that was something we discussed back in chapter 10. And then using the chosen model, we'll estimate it, which produces some visible forecast. And because this visible forecast utilizes the estimated parameters, there's a hat on top of the forecast. Okay. Then, 
Given we produce some forecasts, we want to assess the accuracy and the forecasting performance, which is what we're gonna talk about today using the mean square forecast error. And then later on, we'll consider in exploring the inclusion of additional variables from some other time series to like improve our forecasting precision. And that's the very last chapter of this topic. And we'll come back to chapter 14 the week before the Easter break, okay? So this is the plan. Now, the forecast error. So we briefly talked about this last, uh, sorry, on Monday. So essentially the forecast error is the difference between the actual value of the future observation and the value that we forecasted. So there are two types of forecast errors that comes with the, one comes with the optimal forecast and one comes with the feasible forecast. So first one, the optimal forecast error is essentially the error associated with the optimal one. So this is invisible in practice because one never will be able to obtain the optimal forecast because the optimal forecast depends on the model parameters, the alpha naught and alpha one, which we'll never know what their true value is, okay? So the optimal forecast error, which is the difference between, say the one step ahead forecast is the one between the actual value in the immediate future, the yt plus one, and that's forecasted by the model the yt plus one given t. And remember, this notation is essentially representing the conditional expectation of yt plus one given information available to time t, okay? We define this notation to be the conditional expectation. And remember that big curly Y stands for all information for Y up to the capital T. And we know that the conditional expectation, which we discussed on Monday, emerges as the optimal forecast if our optimality is defined as minimizing the mean square forecasting error, okay? So, Given that we have an AR1 model, we know that this is essentially alpha naught plus alpha one, Y capital T plus U capital T plus one. And we're finding the conditional expectation of this given all past information. So we know that alpha naught constant, so the conditional expectation is itself. Again, alpha one, we can take it out yt, it's given inside the information set, the curly yt. So it's known once we condition on all past information. So it's just equal to itself. And the shock, the ut plus one, is independent of all past information. Okay, so they are independent. Therefore, the conditional expectation of the shock at time p plus one, given all past information is just zero. And this is why the optimal forecast is equal to alpha naught plus alpha one times the yt. Then this implies the optimal forecast error, which is the difference between this and the y capital T plus one, is essentially given by the shock term, okay? the U capital T plus one, the shock happening at time T plus one. So essentially the optimal forecast error comes from the unpredictable component of the model. The shock at the next period that cannot be foreseen using all information available at time T. Okay, so this is the optimal forecast error. Now, The feasible forecast error is then the one associated with the feasible forecast where we replace 
the alpha naught and alpha one in the optimal forecast by their OLS estimates, okay? So the y hat t plus one given t, the visible optimal one step ahead forecast is equal to alpha hat naught plus alpha hat one times the most recent observation y capital T. Then if we take the difference between our visible forecast and the future value, the actual future value, okay, which is equal to alpha naught plus alpha one y capital T, t plus u capital T plus one. Then immediately we can see that the difference between these two, okay, the difference, which is the y t plus one minus the visible forecast, that's first of all given by the difference between the actual naught and the estimated value, okay? And also the difference between the alpha one and the estimated alpha one, and they're multiplied with the same value or the same variable y capital T. So the y capital T serves as a common factor, and we have that being alpha one minus alpha hat one times y capital T. Okay, and there's also the remaining part, which is the shock happening at the period t plus one. And this shock is essentially the same as the value of our optimal forecast error, okay? So we can see that essentially the visible forecast error has two components. One is the optimal forecast error, okay? The one, the unpredictable component, the shock at time t plus one. And another component coming from the differences between the alpha and its estimates. So essentially, that's the estimation error, okay? This is purely due to estimation error. So in any case, whenever we attempt to compute the visible forecast error, even if we have a model that is different from AI1, it always have two components. The one carries by the optimal forecast error, the unpredictable part of our model, the inherent randomness, and the part that comes from the fact that we are actually estimating the optimal forecast, the estimation error, okay? So the estimation error will tend to decrease as our sample size increase, because as the sample size increase, our estimate will become closer and closer to the true parameters, given that they're consistent, okay? So this will make the unpredictable component, the optimal forecast error to sort of dominate in larger sample sizes, but both are still relevant for considering the visible um, forecast error. Now, there is one important result that one always have to keep in mind is that these two error components are orthogonal to each other. And essentially in our case, they are actually independent. And this really comes from the fact that the unpredictable component, the shock at time t plus one is independent of all past information of yt. So, so this part, we know that they are independent with all past value of y. But the estimation error essentially depends on all past values of y up to time capital T, okay? The estimation error, it depends on the y capital T, and it's in fact a function of all past information, okay? So first of all, the alpha naught and alpha one constants, so we don't have to worry about them. Y capital T, essentially a function of the curly Y capital T, okay? And one needs to see that the estimated alphas are essentially the functions of the Y capital T. How have we 
obtain the estimated alpha naught and alpha one, remember they comes from solving the sample OLS problem, okay? The alpha hat naught and the alpha hat one, they are the solutions to the minimization problem where we attempt to minimize the sum of the square deviation yt minus b naught minus b1 yt minus one square t from one to capital T, b naught and b1. Okay, remember that's how we find our OLS estimate. Think back to the cross-sectional case where we have yi that it's equal to, sorry, um, that's the beta hat naught plus the beta hat one xi plus the residual. Okay, how have we obtained the beta hat naught and the beta hat one? By minimizing b naught b1, the sum of yi minus b minus b1 times xi squared, so i from one to n, which is the sample, okay, from one to n. And here, it's just that you're treating the yi, now the dependent variable becomes yt, the regressor xi just becomes the immediate class yt minus one. The beta hat naught in this case is our alpha hat naught. The beta hat one is our alpha hat one. The u hat i is our u hat t, okay? And instead of the sample being from i equal to one to the lowercase n, it becomes t to from one to the capital T, okay? And essentially, we know that the beta hat naught in this case is equal to the sample mean of y minus beta hat one times the sample mean of x. And remember the beta hat one is equal to the sample covariance between y and x over the sample variance of x. The sample variance of x is a function of the value of x given by the data, okay? So this beta hat one being the sample covariance over the sample variance is a function of the sample data. The yi, the xi for i from one to n, okay? And similarly, the beta hat naught being a function of the sample mean of y, the beta hat one, and the sample mean of x must also be a function of the sample data, the y and the x. Then that implies, okay, just kind of changing the notation to the time series case, but everything remains the same. Essentially, that just means the alpha hats, they are a function of the sample data. The yt for t from one to capital T, that's it, okay? And plus the initial value, why not? But all of these, they are embedded in our information set, the y capital T, okay? So essentially, the estimation error, which depends on the alpha hat naught, the alpha hat one, and the y capital T, they are all a function of our, this big curly y t. And that our shock at time t plus one is independent of the curly y t, okay? So this part is a function of the, y cur of the curly y t, the shock is independent of the curly yt, then they must be independent, okay? Because independence basically means that they're independent of any function of the variable. So the two error components of the visible forecast error, they are orthogonal to each other because independence is the strongest form of no relationship. Being independent implies their conditional mean independence, which then implies they are uncorrelated and they are orthogonal. That's what we've learned in topic one, okay? So this is the result that you should always keep in mind. Now, 
another thing before we move on to look at the mean square forecast error is about the terminology. So the visible forecast error essentially is an out of sample prediction error. This is different from the OLS residual. To see this, okay, first of all, for the y hat t, for any t that is between one and a capital T, this is the in sample predict, uh, sorry, in sample fitted value, which is the in sample predicted value, okay? The value that we're predicting for y t, where this y t itself has been used to estimate the alpha hat naught and alpha hat one. Okay, so this is why it's in sample fitted value because YT itself is part of the sample. Now, the one step ahead visible forecast, the Y hat capital T plus one given T, that's an out of sample visible forecast because the YT plus one, the, oh sorry, Y capital T plus one is not part of the sample that we use to estimate the parameters. So we are forecasting for a value that is beyond the sample data. Then this implies the residual, which is the difference between the actual value of Y and that the in-sample fitted value, okay? That is the difference between an absurd value in the data set and the in-sample prediction. Whereas the visible forecast error, that is the difference between the future unseen data, the Y capital T plus one, and the out of sample visible forecast, okay? So the visible forecast error is not a residual. So be careful with the terminology. Now, we have established what actually is the forecast error, but looking at the error itself wouldn't allow us to quantify the performance of the forecasting that we computed because the error can be positive or negative, remember? It's just like back in topic one, we talked about why we attempt to minimize the mean square prediction error because the errors are positive and negative, simply summing them up would just cancel out the values, okay, so we need to square them. And one way to assess the, um, the forecast performance is by using the criterion we attempt to minimize, the MSFE. So the MSFE is simply the expected value of the squared error. So the optimal forecast um, MSFE is just the one that we square the optimal forecast error and we take its expectation. Then for the AR1 model, okay, we call that, we've established the E, the optimal forecast error being just a shot at the next time period, the U capital T plus one. That basically means that the MSFE associated with the optimal forecast is essentially the expected value of our optimal forecast error square that is the same as the expected value of the square of the shock at time t plus one. Now, remember we have assumed that our error term, the shock, they are IID white noise with mean zero and the variance sigma square U, okay? Which means the expected value of UT is zero and the variance of UT is equal to sigma square U for any T given IID, independent and identically distributed. Identical distribution implies they all have the same moment. Now, if we look at the variance of UT, by making use of the definition of variance, something you have seen in advanced stats, that is the expected value of UT 
minus its expectation square. Okay. Now, we know that the expected value of ut is essentially zero. So this term goes away. What is remained is simply the ut inside the bracket, and we need to take the square of that. So the variance of ut is essentially the same as the expectation of its square, okay, given that it has mean zero, which is the same as sigma square u. Therefore, the mean square forecast error associated with the optimal forecast is just sigma square u, the variance of our shock, okay? So this is the optimal forecast MSFD. For the visible one, remember the, vis the visible error, sorry, the visible, bless you, the visible forecast error has two components. One is the estimation error and one is the optimal forecast error. Then coming back to where we were, okay, we were looking at here, that the visible forecast error for an AR1 model. Now, what we have, here, I'm gonna just write it down here. So, what we have for the MSFE associated with the visible forecast, that we have the E hat T plus one given T squared taking the expected value. For AR1, we know that the E hat T plus one given T, this is the estimation error coming from alpha naught minus alpha hat naught plus the alpha one minus the alpha hat one times the YT. This is the estimation error, okay. Let's just call that EE -E for now. To simplify the notation, and we also have the UT plus one, which is the optimal forecast error. Then taking the square of this visible forecast error and its expectation, that it's basically we have EE -E, plus the ut plus one square, okay? The estimation error and the optimal forecast error, we take the square of it and then we take the expectation. Now, expanding the square, basically we have the estimation error square plus two times the estimation error times the U capital T plus one plus the U square capital T plus one. I mean, this should be something you're very familiar with, right? A plus B square is A square plus B square plus two times AB, okay? Then using the linearity of expectation, that basically becomes expected value of EE e square plus the expected value of the middle part, we take the two out, we have the EE e times the U capital T plus one, and then we have the last part, the U square capital T plus one, taken the expectation. So, we're almost there. The last observation is to note that the middle term is zero, following from what we've established. Remember, we just established the fact that the estimation error is orthogonal to the optimal forecast error, given that they are orthogonal. And that the shock has mean zero, the middle term is just zero. It goes away, okay? So the MSFE associated with the visible forecast is simply the sum of the 
expect the, the expectation of the estimation error square, and the last term, our MSFE associated with the optimal forecast, which is just the sigma square u. Okay. So we have the expected value of E E square plus sigma square U, which is the MSFE associated with the optimal forecast. Then this implies okay, given that the first term is the expectation of a square. The square is never negative, so it's always non-negative. This is always greater than or equal to zero. Then basically it means the MSFE for visible forecast must be no smaller than the MSFE associated with the optimal forecast. Okay, so we make, use of the fact that estimation error is orthogonal to the optimal forecast error. And that makes sense. Because they are orthogonal, they are independent, they do not offset each other. Then the visible forecast error, which essentially is the sum of these two, when you consider the variability in that visible forecast error, it must essentially be the sum of the variability in the two error components. So this is something you should always, the second result you should take away from our lecture today is that the visible forecast always have an NSFE mean square forecast error that is no smaller than the one for the optimal forecast, okay? Because of the extra estimation error component. Now, given that the visible forecast error has two error components. The residual variance, which is the sigma hat square u, that attempts to estimate the optimal forecast MSFE will not provide a reliable estimate of our visible forecast MSFE because of the estimation error component, okay? So if you look at this equation here, any attempt to solely estimate the second error component will not give a reliable estimate of the sum, okay? So this is something one has to be careful with. Now, we have established what is the MSFE, but knowing that it's not enough, we need to compute it, we need to estimate it. One challenge with direct calculation of the mean square forecast error is the fact that it's about something that we don't observe. The Y capital T plus H, the one step ahead forecast, the X, sorry, the one step ahead future value, the Y T plus one, the H step ahead future value, the Y capital T plus H is something we don't know. So there's no way we can directly calculate the mean square forecast error. If we happen to know the specific model that we use to describe the underlying time series, just like the AR1 we've seen, then we can attempt to estimate it, okay? We can use the residual variance to estimate the second term, and then we can attempt to compute the first term by considering the variance and the covariance of the OLS estimates. But this is something model specific then basically that implies had we had a different model, let's say an AR2, then we'll have a different expression for the MSFE, and then we will need to consider a different estimate, like different terms that we need to estimate, okay? So computing the MSFE based on the specified model is constrained by the model assumption and the model parameters. But what we really want is we want something that is flexible, that is universally um, applicable. We want something that don't rely on the specific form of the model, 
and we also won an estimation method that does not rely on the forecast horizon. Okay. Remember the one that we have just established? It's only for forecasting the immediate future. We had a different value of H. Again, this MSFE expression will be different. So, this brings us to what is called a pseudo out of sample forecasting. And this is something that can apply to regardless of what model you consider and the forecast horizon, okay? So essentially what we really want to do is simulate the real life scenario by pretending the last 10 to 20 observation in our data set to be out of sample. That's why it's pseudo out of sample forecast. Basically, we're pretending we haven't seen them. Then, basically, okay, we keep out a sample as the pseudo out of sample. So we will set a cutoff point, which is called the T naught. And then we will begin with a subsample ending at some value tau that is equal to this cutoff T naught. We'll estimate the model using the data up to this tau, and then that will give us one forecast value, and then we can calculate the forecast error associated with that forecast value. So that gives us one value of a visible one step ahead forecast. Then the next step is we will increase tau by one, okay? So we now look at tau equal to T naught plus one, and then we will re-estimate the model and then compute another one step ahead forecast and another one step ahead visible forecast error. And by doing so, we'll get a series of the pseudo or out of sample one step ahead visible forecast error. Then it will be very easy to estimate the MSFE in this case. Basically, we just take the average of the sum of squares of these pseudo out of sample visible errors, okay? So this is detailed in the lecture note, so I'm gonna stop here today. And the remaining slides is just some em empirical example of using the pseudo OS for the data set that we've seen, the GDP growth. I'll briefly talk about these two slides on next Monday. And then next week, we're gonna start fresh on types of non-stationarities. Basically, we're gonna talk about structural grades, we're gonna talk about unit root, we're gonna talk about deterministic trend, stochastic trend. And then I'll finish the rest of the slides on Monday. But thanks for coming, and I hope you have a good weekend. I'll see you on Monday. Monday, you'll also get the pre work for the quiz next week, yes, okay. But the quiz will cover everything up to chapter 11 forecasting, okay? Essentially, we have finished this chapter.